is still work to be done in the pioneer places where there is no name for Jesus Christ. And one of the questions of the day for me is as we do it, as we engage in this pioneer mission of getting his name known among all of the nations, as we do it, will we do it with reckless abandon or will we do it just through reasonable risk? Which is it going to be as we go to the nations? Reckless abandon or as we advance the gospel into the unreached regions, reasonable risk. I love the title of the conference, Finish the Mission. And one of the questions I have is what kind of a missionary is it going to take to finish the mission? Get ready, new missionary, for Christ. As you get ready to go, not only are you going to be fighting against your own fears and your own insecurities, uh, you're also going to be fighting against family and friends who are going to be working against you. They're going to be saying, don't go into those dangerous places. So are you going to press on and go? Or are you going to shrink back in fear? These danger questions that I've been wrestling myself uh, with over the course of some years even, not just for the preparation of this message, but in the preparation of this portion of my life, really. I'm wrestling with these danger questions. And one of the things I'm realizing is that danger questions are normally, for the most part, they're American questions. When we get to much of the rest of the world, they're not asking the kinds of questions that we're asking. Most of the rest of the world knows already that being a Jesus follower is already hazardous to their health. They know that already. Persecution and martyrdom is frequent for most believers in third world countries, for example. Something like 170,000 people every year slaughtered just because they love Jesus. This is the daily experience of believers in much of the world. But what about us in the West? What is going to be our response to the very real probabilities of persecution and martyrdom as we go forward? And how shall we go forward? Are, are we going to invest our lives in finishing the mission in those places where there are still strong hostilities against the gospel and against Jesus? Or are we just going to live our lives, you know, counting the reasonable risk cost and leaving most of the rest of the world unreached because it's not prudent to go to those places? C.T. Studd, one of my favorite missionaries, he was a missionary called three different times to the front line Early in his life, he was called to China. Second time, he was called to India. And then when he was my age, 53, the Lord called him again to China. And here's a quote, something he said about the people that tried to hinder him in all three of those cases. They tried to hinder him from going. He said, had I cared for the comments of people, I would never have become a missionary. Well, isn't that the truth? So there's work to be done for the gospel. And the place that I want to begin is just in speaking to you for a moment about the fact that the world, dangerous as it is, it will not be reached by worldly wise people. It's not going to be reached by people who want to save their lives. It's not going to be reached by people who want to pamper their lives. 
The world, that, that world that David Sills talked about in the last hour, that huge world of a, a third of the population of the world still living in darkness with no access to any meaningful gospel. This one third of the world's population, they will not be reached except by fools. That's how they're going to be reached. Men and women that become fools for Christ. Fools for nations. Fools for the tough places where the name of Christ has never gone. That's how the gospel is going to go forward powerfully. Hebrews 11. I wish we had time to go there. By the way, you can turn to Acts chapter 20. We're moving towards our text. I wish Hebrews 11... Uh, it would be my text if I had a second session. But Hebrews 11 is like exhibit A to answer the question, what kind of missionary is it going to take to finish the mission? Read, read, read Hebrews 11, it'll tell you. Great stories. And just about every one of them, are, they are stories of how God moves the kingdom forward through Hardship, suffering, and persecution. Almost always, that's the way it goes. That's the way it happens. And notice, you know, we always go to Hebrews chapter 11 and say, these are the fools for the faith. You know, there's no chapter for the reasonable risk guys. Anywhere. There's no chapter for the play it safe boys. There's no chapter for the experts at risk avoidance for those guys. No, the chapter that's here that we have in chapter 11 Hebrews is a chapter where God is calling people by name, telling their exploits, radical exploits, reckless abandon. You want to know about reckless abandon? Read Hebrews 11, every single one of them. And none of them did anything that was, you know, we would say is reasonable. Not a single one of those stories would you read that story and say, yeah, let's do it that way. No. But what I love about Hebrews 11, it says that God commends them. He commends them for their recklessness. They pleased God. And he commends them. And if you follow the stories of Hebrews 11, and now as we move into Acts chapter 20 with the Apostle Paul, it's like a continuation of the story from these Old Testament fools for God all the way into the New Testament, and now we come to the life of the Apostle Paul himself. Acts chapter 20 is our primary text the question, I've given it to you twice already, here it is again, what kind of missionary is it going to take to finish the mission of the Great Commission? And so here's our text, Acts 20, 22 to 24. And now, compelled by the Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city, every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardship are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me if only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me. And he even tells us what the task is. He says it's the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. Paul says, I consider my life worth nothing to me. Meaning, the gospel is a higher priority than the preservation of my life. Meaning, don't be a coward with the gospel. 
Don't be a coward with the gospel of Jesus Christ. As we take aim with our lives upon these places that are unreached, don't be a coward with the gospel. But rather, hey, I'm reading Paul here. And we're going to read Jesus in just a moment. Paul would say, be reckless for the advance of it. Don't be fearful. Don't be a coward. Be a reckless fool for the advance of the gospel. That's what Paul is saying, Acts 20, 22 to 24. Paul is comparing something in these verses. He's saying that in comparison with the impossible to calculate value of Christ, right? Can't, can't, can't calculate that value of Christ, right? In comparison with Christ, in comparison to the indescribable gospel of God's grace. And in comparison with the privilege we have of taking it to nations. In comparison with all of these things. I consider my life worth nothing to me. And the Apostle Paul is not just blowing smoke. If you read uh, through the book of Acts, if you read uh, some of the epistles, uh, just one little excerpt from 2 Corinthians to let you have a little insight into the kind of life that Paul led. Paul said, 2 Corinthians eleven twenty three 23 and following, we are fools for Christ's sake. He says, I'm talking like a madman. Maybe some of you think I'm talking like a madman. Listen to what he says. He says, I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, often near death. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea. I have been constantly on the move, in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my own people, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the wilderness, in danger at sea, and danger from false brothers. I get the idea that it's dangerous, right? It's dangerous. Dangerous to be a carrier of the gospel. Dangerous to be a missionary. He goes on, he says, I have labored. I have toiled. I've often gone without sleep. Without food. Hunger, thirst, cold, naked. And he goes on. And this is an incomplete biography, by the way, of the Apostle Paul. Some commentators would say that these things were so frequent in the life of Paul that by the time 2 Corinthians came around, he just quit, quit writing about it. He quit talking about it anymore. It was so commonplace. And so when Paul says in Acts chapter 20, I consider my life worth nothing to me, He's literally telling you the truth. He's telling you how he feels. He means it literally. Now in the slightly larger context, because I love this story in the middle of Acts 20, 19, 20, 21, 22, these middle chapters of the book of Acts. I love these chapters. We're, we're right in the middle with Paul, right in the middle of a four-year third missionary journey. Uh, right around 57 A.D. or so. And Paul and his missionary team, they're just getting through this, this riot in Ephesus. You remember that in, in uh, chapter 19? Uh, that was stirred up by Demetrius. And Demetrius, interesting guy, he was the silversmith, a businessman in the city. And he was all tweaked because uh, the gospel was cutting into his business. You know, he was the idol maker. He'd make the artifacts for the people to use as they were... Uh, engaging in this idolatry to the goddess Artemis. And so he was angry, stirred up the whole city against the Apostle Paul. 
Uh, that scuffle settles down a little bit, and the Scripture says Paul then moves on through Macedonia and Greece, and that's where we have him in Acts chapter 20. And just in passing, isn't it interesting the way the Scriptures will say, it'll say things like, and there were more plots against his life as he traveled through the various areas. <laughs> well, Paul was on a mission. He'd already planted churches in the strategic centers of Samaria and Asia and Achaia. Way north and northwest of Jerusalem, he's way up there uh, in, where Philippi and all of those churches in Macedonia are. He's, he's planted those churches. But now he wants to get back to Jerusalem. He wants to carry a gift back to Jerusalem. A gift that was given by the Philippian believers to him to carry to Jerusalem uh, because of this famine that had broken out and the people in Jerusalem and the church there were struggling. And so this is part of why Paul is wanting to get back to uh, Jerusalem. But ultimately, Paul is wanting to get back to Jerusalem and then get to Rome. He wants to get to Rome. And then ultimately, even beyond that, he wants to get to Spain. I mean, this is, I love this about Paul. I mean, this is Paul's attitude. There's churches in Rome, I'm going to Spain. That's Paul. That's Paul. Always moving forward. Always moving ahead. That's Paul. Always advancing into places where the name of Jesus is not gone. And so now he turns his attention to Jerusalem. And remember, all along the way, he's being constantly told by his friends. Don't go to Jerusalem. It's dangerous in Jerusalem. Even his own missionary team, they're saying don't go there. They're not thrilled about that long trek back to Jerusalem and they're not just concerned about the walk. They've heard the prophecies everywhere they go. Prophets are telling them, don't go back. You go back to Jerusalem, hardship, prison, suffering, persecution waits for you. They're not thrilled about going with Paul, but on they go anyway, following Paul's lead. Even though warned by the Holy Spirit in every city, hardship will come. And so as they're going along, we come to chapter 21. And we come to where the team comes into Caesarea. And they're at the house of uh, Philip. You remember Philip was one of the, the first deacons in Jerusalem. Do you remember how he got to Samaria? Persecution broke out after the stoning of Stephen. Persecution uh, just came upon the whole church on the very day of the stoning of Stephen. And people scattered for their lives. Philip was one of those guys. Running for his life. Carrying the gospel with him as he goes. And he ends up uh, in Samaria. Remember, he's the, the same guy that God sent to uh, talk to the, the Ethiopian eunuch. And now he's settled in, in Caesarea. And working with the church there. And Paul and his team are hanging out with Philip. And all this, this time that Paul is with uh, Philip in Caesarea, ab about that time, uh, Agabus comes along. You remember Agabus? The prophet Agabus? And, and remember, this kind of thing happened frequently. Read like 18, 19, 20, 21, and 22 of Acts. This kind of thing happened frequently with the Apostle Paul. Prophets telling him, don't go, don't go, danger ahead if you go. But Agabus, he, he makes a, a pretty good a long trip to Caesarea. He finds Paul and he gives him this prophecy. And you remember how he did it. He took his belt and he wrapped it around his hands and feet and he said, when, if, when you get to Jerusalem, they will bind you like I am bound and that was the prophecy. And so Paul's friends and co-workers are strongly begging him. They're begging him, don't go to Jerusalem. Now, don't, don't miss this. This is an important point. The prophets were true prophets of God. They were giving true words of God to, to uh, Paul about the coming perse persecutions. But his friends were wrong. The prophets were right in the prediction, but his friends were wrong in their advice. They heard the, the prophet 
Agabus speak about the dangers, and rather than encouraging Paul to go, they're begging him to not go. Take note in the text. It says, Paul ignored them. He ignored them. The kind of... What kind of missionaries do we need to take the gospel to the nations and to finish the mission? We need the kind of missionaries that will ignore worldly wisdom that says we should not go into dangerous places with the gospel. Can't you just imagine Paul listening to Agabus after all he's been through? And Agabus says, yeah, there's going to be some prison and some hardship and some suffering when you get to Jerusalem. Hardships are coming? Are you kidding me? I mean, is this news for Paul? Jesus himself had already told Paul all about it. Right? Acts chapter 9, when he was converted on the road to Damascus, Jesus said, I'm going to show him how much he will suffer for my name. And so now Agabus is saying there's going to be trouble, and Paul's saying... It's no newsflash to me. Look at Acts 21.12. After the prophecy of Agabus, I like the way it says this, Luke is the writer, and uh, I, I love the way that he words this. Luke 21.12. It says, when we heard this, this being the prophecy of Agabus, when we heard this, we and the people, we and the people pleaded with Paul not to go up to Jerusalem. I want to ask you, who are the we? We and the people said to Paul, don't go to Jerusalem. The we, who is it? Well, it's Luke. He's included in the we. He wrote the book of Acts, but also Acts 20 verse 4 lists eight other guys that were part of Paul's team. And so that's the we. But he goes on to say, he says, we and the people. Who are the people that don't want him to go, that are begging with Paul not to go back to Jerusalem? Well, that would be Philip and the believers that are in Caesarea. None of them wanted Paul to go back to Jerusalem. Truth is, they didn't want to go back to Jerusalem because they were afraid of what would happen when, when they got there. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad that the Apostle Paul did not make decisions by voting? If they'd taken a vote, none of the Roman Empire would ever have been evangelized because none of it was safe. None of it was easy to reach. Danger everywhere. They couldn't even find a place that could even be remotely called reasonably risky. Remember Paul's itinerary again. I just love this. Just to put it in real short phrases. As you go through the book of Acts, he was chased out of Antioch and Iconium. He was stoned at Lystra. Stripped, flogged, and imprisoned in Philippi. Chased by a mob, a mob of angry Jews in Thessalonica. He was chased all the way to Berea. Physically abused and dragged into court in Corinth. Survived another riot in Ephesus. Plotted against in Syria. And when he finally did get to Jerusalem after this prophecy of Agabus, it, it turned out just as Agabus had said. And Paul was flogged again, smuggled out of Jerusalem. And then after this story, if you keep reading on into the book of Acts, he's later shipwrecked in the Adriatic Sea. He swims ashore on the island of Malta. He was caught in a hurricane force wind along the shore of Crete. And then it says, finally, you get to the end of Acts, and he makes it to Rome where he eventually had his head chopped off. This is Paul's life. And I don't think he ever made it to Spain. So what would we have done? I mean, it's a great story, but I don't want to just charge ahead. What would we have done if we were there as a part of Paul's team and we heard that prophecy from Agabus 
about not going because there's danger ahead. What would we have done? Well, what do we do? Forget about then. What do we do now? What do we do when we hear maybe that there are hostile Muslims in Yemen? Or Iran? Or Morocco? How do we respond now when we hear the challenge to go to places like that? What do we do? Is our response, I don't want to go there? Is that what we say? Like John Patton, when he wanted to go to New Hebrides, the guy stood up and said, you know, the cannibals will eat you there, sir. Don't go there. There's cannibals. But we're no different today. We say, we can't go there. There's terrorists there. There's drug cartels there. Islamic rascals over there. Is that what we say when we hear about the the hard places where the gospel has never gone? So it's easy to criticize Paul's friends, but let's not be like them. And I love this again. It says that they were breaking Paul's heart. Not because they were telling him about coming persecutions. That's not what broke Paul's heart. What broke Paul's heart is that they were trying to talk him out of going on his mission for Christ and the gospel. That's what broke his heart. But it says Paul would not be dissuaded. Similar thing when Peter tried to save Jesus from Jerusalem. Remember that? Mark 8 is one of the places Jesus had just told his disciples the good news. They didn't realize that it was good news the way Jesus packaged it. Jesus said, I must go to Jerusalem. I must suffer many things. I must be rejected by elders and priests. I must be killed. And after three days, I will be raised again. And Peter wouldn't hear of it. No, Lord, that'll never happen to you, Jesus. Surely there's another way, Jesus, another way to get around Jerusalem. No, Peter, there's no other way. And Jesus rebuked him. He rebuked that statement. Because this is the way Satan thinks. Peter's response to Jesus in trying to hinder him from going to Jerusalem was demonic. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. You don't know the things of God. The thing of God. What was it? The thing of God was to go to Jerusalem. And die. And Satan always wants to do an end run around obedience. Always wants to get around the cross. Always wants to find another way. And Jesus rebukes Peter because he was spouting off this demonic philosophy. Another text. You know, it's impossible to out-radical the radicalness of Jesus. There's nothing I can do to out-radical him. Luke 14. He says, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father, hate his mother, wife, children, brothers, sisters, and yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Did you hear those words? Cannot be my disciple. He didn't say, you can't be a missionary. He said, you can't be a Christian. You can't be a disciple. You can't be a follower of me unless you're willing to live this way. And you start preaching like that and people are going to say, well, nobody's going to listen to a message like that. Well, they can't be saved then. Right? There wasn't just one rich young ruler that Jesus sent along his way. 
over the last 2,000 years. And you understand, I'm not talking about doing works that somehow get us into right relationship with God. What I'm saying is that Jesus deserves everything. He demands everything. He's worth everything. We cannot have Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior and then live any way we wish. We can't do that. We're bought with a price. We don't belong to ourselves. And if Jesus wants to take my body and plant it like a seed in the earth, a gospel seed to bring about a crop for His name, He has every right to do that. And I'm saying, if He does it, it's a privilege for me. It's a privilege for me if He does it. And I should go to the dirt rejoicing to be used in that great way by God. But this isn't the way we normally think, is it? Man, I love to read about these Chinese believers. Even today, certainly in the past, but even today, some of these guys, they're coming out of prisons. Incredible sufferings that they endured in prisons. And they come out praying. And you know what they say when they pray, some of them? They say, Lord, where do you want me now? I read one report where some of them were praying, Lord, where do you need a martyr? Where do you need a martyr, Lord? Human wisdom and human reasoning is not going to lead us along this path. This next little section in my notes here, I've got a box around it. And it reminds me when I get to this box, it's a caution to me, that maybe I shouldn't say what's in this box. (laughs) Ah, But why stop now, right? It's a quote by Martin Luther, where he's talking about human reasoning and how human reasoning is an enemy to faith. Classic, classic Luther. Listen to this. It's not very long at all, just a couple of sentences. Human reasoning, he says, human reasoning is a whore. (laughs) Okay. That's pretty to the point. What do you mean, Martin Luther? Human reason is a whore. It's the greatest enemy that faith has. It never comes to the aid of spiritual things. But more frequently than not, it struggles against the divine word, teaching with contempt all that emanates from God. Well, that's pretty radical. And as I'm thinking about this quote and putting it into the context of mission, I completely agree that human reasoning almost never leads us on the path of reckless abandon for God and for the nations and for the gospel. It almost never does. Human reasoning leads us towards the easy way. It leads us towards the ways of least resistance. It doesn't lead us to the kind of faith that pleases God. Certainly not the kind of faith that we read about in Hebrews 11. So again, getting back into the the text of Acts 20. What would we have done when we heard the prophecy of Agabus if it had been given to us? More hardships? What are we going to do about that? Cannibals? What about them? The real missionary says, cannibals in New Guinea? Well, there's elect among them. Let's go get some of them for Jesus. That's what the missionary says. Even in this text, in Acts 20, finally, (laughs) isn't this great? I love this. Um, It says, um, let me find it. I think I... It says, as, see, they came to the conclusion, it says, may the will of the Lord be done. 
That's what the disciples finally came after the uh, prophecy of Agabus and, and uh, trying to keep Paul from going. And when it says Paul would not be dissuaded, it says that they finally turned their eyes also to Jerusalem and said, may the will of the Lord be done. Well, they should have been saying that in the first place, but I'm glad they got to the point. But here's what I want to say just in these last remaining moments. This is what I believe, and just as bare-knuckled as I can give it to you, and quickly as I can, the reason that I talk so much about missionary martyrdom and reckless abandon and these kinds of themes, it's because I'm looking for missionaries. I'm looking for the right kind of missionaries. I'm looking for the kind of missionaries that can go and make it last on the field longer than the, 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 the average right now that is 2.2 years for somebody who thinks that they're going to be a career long-term missionary. I want you to know that the world is still a dangerous place for missionaries. And if we care very much about that fact, we're not going to do very much to advance the gospel. Don't ever think that mission is a peacetime operation. It's not. And we've prayed for you over these weeks and months of preparation. Somebody told me some months ago that there would probably be 3,500 people in this conference. I just, as I'm praying, I just feel that the Lord began to lead me to ask Him, Lord, would you give give us 500 martyrs? It's more than a tithe, because I'm a New Testament guy. I don't believe in tithing. (laughs) 3,500 people, 500 martyrs, that's cool. And the other 3,000 of you should be martyrs as well. You should be financial martyrs to make sure that they get sent along their way. And so all 3,500 of us are not outside of the call. We're inside the call. If we're called to Christ, we're called to mission. All of us. We're called to mission. What is the mission? It's to go and to make His name great among all nations. That's the mission. Everyone is part of the mission. Lord, would you raise up 500 from these 3,500 at this conference to go, and would you compel the other 3,500, Lord, maybe to sell some homes or second or third cars, and let's get them sent. But let's all share equally in the suffering and the hardship of getting the gospel to the nations because Jesus is worth it. It's not just worth it for the one that goes, it's worth it for the one that sins. And as we go, there will be hardship just as for Paul. If we hear about the danger in this world and we are ruled by our fears... If we are controlled by human reasoning and counsel, even from believers, then we're not going to do very much to get the gospel to these tough places. (laughs) As my old mentor used to say, too many missionaries are like homing pigeons. Homing pigeons, meaning... Wherever in the world we're sent for the gospel, we'll be sure to quickly make our way back home when the going gets tough. Well, I don't want to be a missionary like that. I don't want to train and send missionaries like that. Because cowards don't glorify God. So you need to know mission. Just need to know it up front. Just embrace it. Say, this is a fact. This is a truth. Mission is inherently dangerous. And as we go, we must know, we must be reminded, we must never forget, we are in a mighty warfare for the souls of nations. This is what I love about this. It's like, I don't play cards hardly at all. I know nothing about five-card stud, but I do know, I think I know, 
that the, high, the best hand you can get in a card game is a royal flush. Is that right? I'm dealt a royal flush as a missionary every single day. And I go into the battle. It doesn't always feel like I've got a royal flush straight. It often feels like I'm being attacked and oppressed, and I am. And it feels like we're not going to be able to make it another step. It feels like the gates of hell are just uh, advancing and threatening to wipe us out. That's what it feels like. But that's not the reality in spiritual warfare. Jesus said, the gates of hell will not prevail. And I was thinking, gates. Hell has gates. You don't advance with gates. You protect the fortress with gates. The kingdom of God on earth doesn't have gates. Because we're advancing. It's not the enemy that's advancing on us. We're advancing on the enemy. And my main point when I talk about the mission being dangerous, it's mainly dangerous for the devil. He'll do some stuff. He'll few, throw a few licks our way. But it's dangerous for him. Because we go in his name. We're ambassadors of the king. And when we speak, we speak with all of the authority of the king behind us. And the gates of hell will not stop us. Even though it doesn't always feel like that. But because that is the truth in mission, I want to go recklessly. If, 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 if I'm going to err, I want to err on the side of recklessness. Not on the side of, of caution. Because I never see anywhere in Scripture where the, the, the reasonable risk guys, the quick, quick exit evacuation guys, I don't see anywhere where they are commended. I see, you know, the miserly faith guys, I don't see them being commended. What I see is the reckless abandoned guys. They're the ones that are being commended. They are the ones that God says, please me with their faith. And so I want to be like that. What kind of missionary do we need to finish the mission? We need the, the, the Revelation 12, 11 kind. You know that text? Those who do not love their own lives so much as to shrink from death. That's the kind of missionaries we need. And so as a ministry to every tribe of ministries, if the choice ever comes to us to not go forward just because it's dangerous... We're going forward. We're going forward. We, we, just, we just are. There may be other reasons sometimes maybe to not go into a place, tactical, strategic reasons, but if danger's the issue, we're going. Because, like Paul, we don't demand self-preservation as a prerequisite for whether we go or stay in a place for the gospel. You know what it comes down to, brothers? Who do you love more? I mean, do you love yourself? Do you, do you view the preservation of your own life as being more important than the uh, advance of the gospel? I mean, that's what it comes down to. If you say, I'm not going to go to a place because of the danger, you're saying that the gospel is not worth my life. I don't ever want to say that. Now, I've, I've had people tell me many times over the years. They say, brother, you keep going into Papua New Guinea, you're going you're to lose your life over there. And I say, no, sir. A lot of things can happen to me in New Guinea. But losing my life is not one of them. Because Jesus said, if you lose your life, you gain it. And people say, oh, yeah, 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 you, you, but you know what I mean. If you keep going to New Guinea, you're going to die over there. And I say, yeah, but do you understand what Jesus really means? Do you understand what Jesus is saying? He's not playing word games when he says that if you lose your life, you gain it. If a tribal chief chops my head off, he's doing me a favor. 
I mean, think about it. I mean, no, that's a radical statement. I know some of you chuckling and some of you not chuckling. But think about it. I think it was A.W. Tozier. I think he's the one <clears throat> that said, Christians don't tell lies. They just sing them. Well, we sing songs about Philippians 121. To live is Christ and to die is gain. Are we singing lies when we sing that? And when I say, if a tribal chief chops my head off, he's doing me a favor, I'm saying, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Do we really believe that? Do we believe that to die is gain? And I tell our, our new missionaries that we're, we're training, I said, you know, the worst thing that can happen to you, pick the hardest, most difficult, most dangerous place in the world to go to. You go to that place, the worst thing that can happen to you, the very worst thing that can happen, is that you'll come back alive. <laughs> that's the worst thing, and that's good. If you come back alive, you just keep preaching Jesus. The best thing is if you get airmailed to Jesus. The problem is we don't really believe that. What kind of missionaries do we want? I better keep an eye here. i got two minutes. What kind of missionaries do we want? I want first responder missionaries. I want the kind of missionaries that, that, that run into the, the Twin Towers when they're bombed. When everybody else is running out, they're running in knowing that they're going to die because they value the lives of these people they're trying to rescue as more valuable than their own lives. Americans are not cowards. Americans will run into buildings, burning buildings. Americans will jump into frozen rivers to, to rescue somebody that's, that's drowning. If that's true, why won't we go to Muslim countries? Why won't we joyfully lay our lives down for the gospel in those places? The only conclusion I can come to is that, that we don't value Christ and the gospel enough. We will give our lives for the important stuff. But too often the gospel and Christ don't make the important stuff list. All right, let me just finish with this. A quote. I've got to give you this quote. It's, it's a quote uh, from Ed McCulley. You know who Ed McCulley was? One of the five, right? One of the Alca, uh, mission, one of the missionaries to the, the I call them the, the Ecuador Five, Jim Elliott and those guys. Here's the quote. This quote has become sort of the theme of my life. It's become like, uh, we use it even as our ministry blog, and it's become the title of this new book that I've written. But here's where I got reckless abandon. Just a few years before Ed McCulley joined Jim Elliott in Ecuador, this is what Ed McCulley wrote to Jim Elliot. He says, I have just one desire now, to live a life of reckless abandon for Christ, and I'm putting all of my strength and energy into it. Maybe the Lord, maybe the Lord will send me someplace where the name of Christ is unknown. And then a few years later, He's in Ecuador now with Jim Elliott. They're planning this trip into the Alcas where they just get slaughtered horrifically just two days, I think, before they went on the trip. And Ed McCulley scribbles this short little note in the margin of his journal. It says, I'm willing to give my life for a handful of Indians. And two days later, he did it. With his five friend, four friends, the five of them, they did it. This is what I'm talking about when I talk about reckless abandon and the nations and getting the gospel to the nations. It's dangerous. It's hard. It's warfare. In every warfare, there are casualties. There will be casualties in this one. And Jesus is worth it. He's worth it all. And I'll end just with the reading of our text again. And now compelled, compelled, by the Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me. Prison and hardship are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. 
If only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace.